in the Newton series, we have this really incredible opportunity that we get to hear from founders and, uh, and uh, people of diverse experience. Uh, the founders tend to be CEOs, CSOs, CIOs, CTOs, but we have yet to hear from someone who's a founder and a CXO. Um, over the past decade, the term design thinking has been more and more important. And now, if you're starting a new company, you need to know a lot about design thinking and brand. And that experience is incredibly important. And in the past year, the position of CXO, which frankly sounds coolest of all those titles, uh, has also come into being. So tonight's speaker is a CXO. He is a chief customer experience officer, and in that role, you are responsible for, as it were, the customer experience and the brand of a company. And brand, as you're thinking about building your product or service, is key. It is your secret weapon. So as we listen to different entrepreneurs, one thing we don't often hear about, we hear about the technology, maybe the marketing, the funding, but you don't often hear about how you build a brand, which makes me extremely excited about tonight's speaker, Alder Yarrow, standing in front of us. Um, Alder has, for the past year, five years, been the Chief Customer Experience and Brand Strategy Officer at Cibo, uh, C-I-B-O, for all you Italian speakers out there. Uh, Chibo is one of the world's preeminent brand experience companies, and prior to Chibo, Alder was, Alder was excuse me, founder and principal at Hydrant. Um, I guess signifying that it's hard to take in a lot of information from a hydrant, I'm not even sure. Oh, there's a much deeper sort of intricate marketing metaphor behind that, but we won't bore them with that. Uh, well, I'm so. sure it's not boring. Um, but one of the things that is interesting is that Alders work with brands that you have probably heard of, Twitter, YouTube, Patagonia, and who has heard of Anki Overdrive? Has anybody played with Anki Overdrive? Yes, right. I like it. Uh, I was fascinated by it. It's a toy com It's a company that has uh, cars going around a track, I believe, in the it, most simple way of describing well, it. Well, none of you were alive when slot racing was a thing, but this is uh, robotic battle slot racing without the slots. Yeah, I where the cars is. are driven by artificially intelligent robots, and they remember what you do, and you can't beat them the same way the next time. Maybe we'll increase the sales for that. It's so interesting. Uh, there might be some brands that you're less familiar with, I'm probably more familiar with, like Home Depot, Cisco, and Starwood Resorts. Um, but he also created his very own brand and is pretty much close to a celebrity in the wine industry. Um, he's the founder of Vinography, serves as its editor-in-chief. He's called the pioneer of wine blogging and wine world's brightest cyber star. Uh, we don't often have somebody who's so well-known in the wine industry here. Uh, he's the author of a coffee table book called The Essence of Wine, the author of a chapter on Marin and Sonoma County, Go California Wines, in Opus um, Vino. And he received his BA and MFA from Stanford, which is great, and a focus on with a focus on... No, no hissing? Come on. Because we're all open oh, and it's all It's good. a new age. You, uh, Plus you have the hello and people red People would have been white. throwing stuff when I was in college. So oh, There you go. Uh, and uh, you, with the focus on communications, new media for that time, which is kind of interesting also, and photography. So please, a warm welcome for Alder Yarrow. Thank you very much. Hello and happy Tuesday. Thanks for sharing your evening with me. Um, and thanks for the wonderful uh, introduction and for the chance to be here. It's fun to talk about yourself and what you love to do. Um, and so this is, this is great. Uh, unfortunately, we won't be talking about wine. We'll save that for another night. Uh, tonight, it's about brand experience. So, um, but also by way of introduction, um, uh, hello, come on. Can you do that? No, where's my control? All right, well, we'll be there in a second. There we go. Uh, I'm a husband and a father, a 10-year-old daughter, and my wife Ruth there. Um, and as uh, Vicky said, uh, I am a CXO, so Chief Experience Officer. Very cool title, much more fun to be a CXO than a CEO. What is a CXO? So as a CXO, I get to answer really great questions for executives and companies that come to us for help. Um, questions like, 
How do we differentiate from the competition? Who are our customers and what do they really want? Uh, what kind of personality should we have as a company? Come on, you can do it. What features should our product have and why? And this is not working in the way that it should. I'm gonna try to move it up here in case there's like a Bluetooth coverage issue. And hopefully that won't topple off in the course of the conversation. There we go. Uh, what should we name our next product? For that matter, what should we name the company? Most importantly, how do we convince people to give us a lot of money? How do we make the product or the experience awesome? How do we make customers love us? And so I answer these types of questions with teams of designers, strategists, project managers, anthropologists who do user research. Um, and I do that at a company called Chibo. Um, I won't bore you with the crazy naming story about that, uh, needless to say, other than when we needed to put a name on the piece of paper that registered the company, everybody was sitting in Chibo Cafe in Sausalito, and we thought, well, we can always change it later, and then, <laughs> then life happens. Um, as Vicky says, we do work with some really interesting companies um, whose names you've heard of, whose logos you probably recognize, and just to give you a sense of that work, I'm gonna do a, just like a quick visual tour of some of the projects we've ex executed over the last few years. So, uh, for Tesla, uh, Tesla has a very carefully thought through showroom experience, and they wanted to bring that showroom experience into the living room. Not everybody can get down to a Tesla dealership when they're considering buying the sports car. This was also back when they were about to, where they were just launching the Model S, and they had to get over a big hump, which was convincing people to buy an all electric sports car, and those people had about five major objections to buying an all electric car. What if I forget to charge it? How do I get to Tahoe if I want to take a road trip? Blah, blah, blah. How do I drop the kids off if they forget to charge it? Things like that. And so we brought that experience in the living room uh, through a web-enabled uh, iPad kind of experience that lets somebody self-educate themselves about a car and then go ahead and make a, a reservation about that. Um, for, and again, it's just not behaving. I'm really sorry about this, folks. Um, for Lenovo. Uh, laptop maker, uh, they wanted to start competing with the MacBook Air uh, instead of the Dells and the uh, HPs of the world. Um, and so they hired us to do a product launch campaign for their new X1 Carbon laptop. Ended up being their single uh, most successful global product launch and really elevated the conversation out of the speeds and feeds of how many megahertz they have and how many uh, megabytes in the hard drive into more functional and beautiful elements of the, the user experience. Uh, for Disney, uh, we helped them launch, uh, design and launch their very first luxury resort uh, experience online. So the Alani Resort, uh, one of the interesting things here was trying to help them walk that line between the magic of Disney, but not so cartoony that people would feel weird about paying $900 a night for a luxury resort in Polynesia. Um, for the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, perhaps you guys have visited the very large screen arrays that are in all the lobbies that showcase the art and give you messages. We design the interactive experience of those uh, screens. Uh, we're doing all of the digital brand experience for Subaru in Southeast Asia across 10 different countries. So television commercials, billboards, print magazines, but also the showroom experience, the car show experience, uh, basically everything that's uh, customer facing for, for Subaru in, in 10 countries. Uh, for Salesforce, we're sort of an extension of their web marketing team, so a large part of the Salesforce website that you interact with right now, uh, we've designed in conjunction with them, as well as building all sorts of interesting uh, uh, prototypes and interactive experiences for their annual Dreamforce event uh, in San Francisco. Uh, for Volcom, a brand that some of you might actually be familiar with, um, uh, they put on the Pipe Pro Surf Contest every year, uh, and they have plenty of uh, fans that can't make it to Fiji or to any place like that, but who still want to keep up with the surf contest. So this puts that surf contest in your pocket in the form of an app on the phone, so you can follow along, you find out when Kelly Slater's up, you can message about it with your friends, or if you miss it, uh, you, you get to see the highlights afterwards. Um, for George Zimmer, who's a very famous name for people of my generation, he started the Men's Warehouse uh, National Men's Clothing Line, very famous for his line, you're gonna look good, I guarantee it. Um, 
And uh, they kicked him out of his own company a few years ago. And after licking his wounds, he decided to start his own uh, tuxedo rental company because that was the single most profitable piece of the men's warehouse business. And he came to us with a legal pad and $20 million and said, I need everything. I need the name of the company. I need the brand. I need the online experience. Uh, go. And so we designed uh, Generation Tux for him. Um, you guys might have seen some uh, national TV ads about that. Um, so that's just a quick tour of what Chibo does, how we do it. I'll talk a little bit more about the philosophy and the way that we work in a moment, but that was just sort of to ground you into like who I am, what I do, what I might be doing here, and now I'm gonna slow down and back up and talk about how I got here um, because you guys are interested in entrepreneurship and that journey. So uh, once upon a time, uh, I grew up in the only trailer park in Aspen, Colorado, a tiny little town everybody's heard of. Um, uh, and uh, I went to high school there, uh, sort of a quick uh, bike ride or, come on, uh, um, a quick bike ride and a walk from, uh, no, one more, let's see, from these mountains here, the most photographed mountains uh, in, the, in North America. Um, and uh, started high school in 1988 and uh, was about as interested in the outdoors as I was my classes. Uh, spent a lot of time outdoors uh, and when it came to graduating and applying to college, um, I uh, wrote my college uh, application essay uh, in answer to the question, if you could spend a year doing only one thing, what would that be? Um, and for me, the answer was fly fishing. Uh, and um, apparently it was good enough to, to get me into that country club across the bay. Um, sorry. Uh, I did get into UC Santa Cruz, but I decided to go to, to Stanford instead. Um, and I started at Stanford, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. Um, I had done a bunch of film and video stuff in high school, and I thought, huh, you know, maybe I want to become a cinematographer, but I also knew that I probably wanted to get a decent education in the process, and so I thought, well, I'll just I'll go to Stanford and we'll see what happens. Um, and it turns out that Stanford has a really cool dark room, and I ended up spending a lot of time in the dark room, and they have a really cool uh, 16 millimeter film studio. I spent a lot of time in that, and I ended up uh, double majoring in fine art photography and uh, communication with an emphasis on documentary film studies, including documentary film production. Um, so over the course of my four years, I wandered around with a big uh, Ansel Adams style four by five inch large format camera, wandering in the hills and taking trips to, uh, to places like England and, and various other places like that uh, uh, to take photographs like this one um, of industrial waste that were bound to get me uh, no gainful employment anywhere after graduation. Um, and my junior year abroad, uh, because Stanford has a program to let you do this, I studied at Oxford. Um, so I went over to England in the cold and dark. It sort of looked like this most of the time. And uh, in addition to spending time in the dark room there, I studied you know, wildly uh, useful things like the works of J.R.R. Tolkien and British social realist cinema uh, and things like that. But then uh, in the spring of uh, midwinter 1994, Someone grabbed me by the arm and took me down to the computer cluster, plopped me down in front of a computer and said, look at this. And none of you probably have any idea what that is, but that is the first web browser, NCSA Mosaic. And before that, there weren't things to look at on the web. And they put me down in front of that, and I thought, holy shit, this is cool. And they said, no, 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 wait, 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 look at this. And they took me to another page, and I said, wow, what is that? And they said, that is a home page. And I said, I need me one of those. And so by the time I got back to Stanford in the spring of my junior year, I had taught myself HTML, something that most people hadn't even heard about at that point. But it turns out that uh, while my math scores weren't good enough to get me into MIT, uh, I could do enough with computer programming to, to write HTML. Um, and as I graduated, uh, well, so first of all, I found out that <laughs> people would pay me to do this. 
Uh, so I came back and the art department needed a website. And I was like, you're gonna pay me to do this? Great! So I could earn a little pocket money uh, as I was uh, finishing my degree. And uh, in the spring, I was faced with a choice, which was, do I go to film school and be poor? Do I go get an MFA in photography and be poor? Or do I go get a job? And I started looking around and lo and behold, people still wanted to pay me to do HTML. And so I joined a company. Uh, I was the first employee. I met a guy who wanted to start a web design agency. Um, it was pretty lame. Uh, there's our homepage. Uh, we had the glorious name of Webnex. You know, Web Nexus, get it? Um, and you know, because it's the web, you gotta have a spider. Um, yeah, um, it was 1996, nobody knew what they were doing or anything like that. And the guy said, how much do you want to make? And I named the astronomical sum, twice what my parents had ever made individually in their lives of $40,000. And he said, how about 39? I said, yes! And he said, what do you want your title to be? And I said, webmaster. I wish I'd kept those business cards, because that's like, I don't know, that's so retro and awesome, I, I should have that framed someplace. So I was a webmaster. And we started getting clients. We worked for Cisco Systems, Sun Microsystems, which was a big computing deal back then. Nobody's ever heard of it now, because they went sort of down, they were 10 years ahead of their time. Um, uh, what else? Uh, various uh, companies in the Bay Area, and, um, Gradually, I went from doing everything, system administration, HTML, graphic design, all that stuff, to being the guy who sat down with the client and listened to what they were trying to achieve and figured out what that meant in terms of what web pages they should have and what content they should have on those web pages. And then a book came out called Information Architecture, and I realized, oh, I'm an information architect. Um, because what I do is I figure out how to organize all this information and how to get people to navigate through it and all sorts of stuff like that. And I, you know, sort of, we built that company up to about 25 people and I had hired people who were better than HTML at me and people who were better than graphic design at me. Um, but it also became clear after about that time that the guy who started this company and the people that he had giving him money had some limitations and so it was time for me to move on. And so I joined a company in San Francisco called Adjacency, Brand New Media. And Adjacency was like one of the hottest design agencies in, on the West Coast. They, we did the first website for Power Bar, for Rollerblade, for Specialized, for Land Rover, Patagonia's first website, Rand McNally's, William Sonoma's uh, website and wedding registry online, Nordstrom's first website, um, the Apple Store, the first version of the Apple Store where you could go on and buy Apple products online. Um, really awesome agency. And when they were hiring me, I said, oh, I'm an information architect, you need an information architect. And they said, well, we've got this job description, we're calling it business analyst, and it's about listening to clients and figuring out what their requirements and needs are, and then figuring out what the website should have on. I said, that's information architecture. They said, well, no, it's, it's business analysis. I said, well, just give me the job, and we'll figure it out. So they did, and a couple weeks later, I had them convinced that it was information architecture. I started and ran that group at Adjacency, um, and then, uh, not too long after that, uh, that company was purchased by Sapient. And uh, this was the third uh, company that Sapient had purchased in recent times. Uh, and uh, they had uh, an information architecture group from Adjacency that I was running. They had an information architecture group that they had grown internally. And they had an information architecture group from a company called Studio Archetype that they had also acquired. And my job, as soon as the companies were acquired, was to figure out how to make all those people speak the same language and do the same thing. And so I spent a deal of time uh, sort of managing the leaders of all those uh, different disciplines to come up with what turned out to be the first industry standard information architecture methodology, just in time for us at the end to decide that we were gonna call it user experience, not information architecture. Over the course of that career, uh, from 99 uh, onwards, 
Uh, we did work for, I did work for Cisco, for HP, it did a huge redesign of HP.com under Carly Fiorina, uh, the third iteration of the wine.com website, uh, the first e-commerce capability that Verizon Wireless had, um, Nissan's website, Sunglasses Hut's website, Fidelity, Beckman Coulter, et cetera. Um, and during that time, they said, hey, Alder, do you have any interest in helping us open our Japan office? And so I was single, I didn't have any pets, I had just killed the last two orchids that I had in my possession, and I thought, sure, what the hell, I'll go to Japan. So I went to Japan for a couple years, um, in 2000, and uh, hardest two years of my life. Uh, I spoke really good sushi Japanese, and that was about it at that point. Um, so I, I could own, uh, uh, you know, order a mean maguro uh, at the sushi counter, but it was a whole cultural experience of going there, finding an office, hiring people, training them, uh, finding customers, etc. cetera. Um, uh, hardest two years of my life, but also some of the most rewarding, and, and I have an enduring love for, uh, uh, for Japan uh, ever since. Um, and right about the time I was finishing, 9-11 uh, happened. I moved back to the States and basically had to lay off everyone that I had ever hired. Um, the company was contracting, the economy was, was awful, um, and the writing was on the wall. You know, they, people were literally telling me, well, so I know you have half the amount of people, but we still need to keep doing this, and by the way, you're not gonna get a raise or bonus for the next two years, which is highly motivating, right? Um, and so I said, fuck that. Uh, <laughs> And I quit. Uh, and all these people that I had laid off were out freelancing and doing stuff. I thought, maybe maybe I could do that, right? I mean, I, I managed these people. I trained these people. I can go out there, and I can freelance. And so I, I quit. I took a couple weeks to relax. And then I sort of hung out my shingle. And I went out there in the world and uh, said, hello? Is anybody out there? And there were no answers. And I hung out for a while, and it was two weeks, and then it was three weeks, and then it was four weeks, and I was like, oh my God, I have made the worst mistake of my life. Uh, what am I gonna do? But then uh, I got a call, uh, random, I think somebody's, I, don't, I can't even remember how I got connected with them, but a little marketing agency in San Francisco said, hey, we've got some web stuff, we need some help with, we don't really know much about the web, could you come in and, and help us? And that was Carlson Marketing Group. Um, and so I came in as a freelancer, and it turns out that the guy that they had just hired to manage that office was really good friends with the new vice president of all the direct business at the Home Depot, and lo and behold, they had a big RFP for redesigning homedepot.com, and basically we were a shoe in So we put together the RFP together, and I spent about a year and a half uh, redesigning homedepot.com, and then Jimboree came along and spent about a year uh, redesigning Jimboree.com. And in the process, this was for an agency that really did like direct marketing, like they, they designed postcards that people sent out by the hundreds of thousands or millions to try and get people to do things. They didn't know a thing about the web, and so we had to build an entire team internally to do this, about 20 people. Um, and in the course of doing this, I ended up working with a guy that I used to work with at Sapient, but whom we never were on the same project together. I would see him in the hallways and we would, we would joke together or whatever. Um, but after doing this for, for a couple years, uh, I had a little bit of a light bulb moment, um, uh, which in retrospect is, is not particularly brilliant. So one, I realized time equals money. But more importantly, what I realized was that actually no time equals no money, which is to say that as a freelancer, the only time I ever got paid was when I was working. And if I ever was not working, nobody was paying me, which is kind of a problem if you want to take vacations and things like that. So I'm like, huh, there's got to be a better way. Uh, the second thing I realized was working for the man sucks, which is to say that this company didn't know anything about what they were doing. They weren't offering us any moral support, certainly no logistical support. And basically, we were doing all the work and they were making all the money. Um, and so the third idea was sort of like, huh, it can't, it can't be that hard, can it? And so I took to this, turned to this guy, Bob, and said, hey, Bob, let's go start a company, do this by ourselves. We just did this for this agency, and we could have made a lot of money from this. Let's go do this. He said, sure, we go do that. Um, and then I realized there were some things I didn't know. Um, starting a company wasn't all that logistically difficult, but I didn't know the first thing about accounting, 
about economics, about marketing, really. I mean, I knew how to do web stuff, but not real marketing, like how you get people to pay attention to your company and become their customers. Um, or organizational design, like what did I want this thing to, to, to look like? Um, and so, but that never stopped a good entrepreneurial story, and so off we went uh, and uh, created Hydrant. And the idea behind Hydrant was to do some of the stuff that we had been doing, but in a different way. And Hydrant was really organized around five beliefs that I had about where the world was going. Belief number one was that as the global marketplace is evolving, the traditional means of, of uh, uh, differentiating yourself from the competition were increasingly becoming commoditized, right? Uh, none of you are probably old enough to remember when delivering pizza in 30 minutes was a big deal. But at one point, that was like why Domino's made gajillions of dollars, because they were the only people that could do that. Um, in this day and age, when there's contract electronics manufacturing and all of these design skills and, and, and lean startups and marketing innovation and the web and competitors in China and India and people willing to work for pennies on the dollar, like just about anything you invent that isn't like literally intellectual property patented IP can be duplicated somewhere between three and six months by any competitor that you have, people say. They've done studies on this, I can't quote one. But that's really happening in the marketplace. Also what's happening is that as technology proliferates, the interactions that companies are having with their customers are becoming more complex, more intricate, more varied, and increasingly technology mediated. And you know what? Those experiences kind of suck. They've become fractured, inconsistent, painful, because coordinating across all those different touch points and customer moments is really, really hard. And so because it's hard, and because it's complex, delivering a great experience has become itself a real competitive advantage in the marketplace. And study after study is now showing that we, consumers and businesses alike, are willing to pay more if we get a great experience. And so these were the five things that I thought, you know what, that means there's room for a company that focuses on companies helping them deliver a great customer experience. And so that's what Hydrant uh, was all about. Um, and at Hydrant, we ended up, uh, oh, sorry, this, here's the origin story of Hydrant, right? 500 bucks each for me and my, uh, my friend, two guys at first working from home, uh, a bunch of freelancer friends, but then eventually we got to hire, and that's like a huge gulp because you got to pay those people, and like now their kids are depending on you. And then maybe some of them don't work out, and you have to fire, which really sucks. And then eventually you have to buy furniture and get an office space, and that's really expensive. And it's like, wait, that comes out of my pocket. Um, anyway, the, this is the, you know, the perils of, of starting your own services company. Um, but we, we did OK. Um, we ended up finding some companies that wanted to work with us. Uh, we designed the first touch screen uh, interface in the very first Tesla Roadster. Um, some of you have probably seen the current Tesla Roadsters. The old ones, it was like a little four inch screen down by your left knee. The really interesting design challenges, we had to be able to allow you to control it while going 120 miles an hour and not killing yourself, um, which was interesting. We turned the whole screen into a button so you just like could tap anywhere and toggle between things when you were driving and then when you weren't driving, it became a normal user interface with little buttons the size of your fingertips. We designed room and boards website, Mohawk Paper Company, uh, E Entertainment Online, Starwood Hotels and Resorts, um, uh, Motorola, things like that. Um, and then uh, in 2010, a friend of mine, Lou Lacourt, came to us and said, hey guys, I'm starting an agency. Do you have any space I could rent? And so we said, yeah, actually the back room is free. Um, uh, you can have that back room. And uh, so, he came into the back room and uh, we said, what's, what's your company called? He said, Chibo. He said, okay, what the hell does that mean? He says, it means food in Italian. And we said, well, what's the story? He's like, well, we were in this cafe. Um, and uh, he said, oh, by the way, thanks for the space. I don't have any employees yet. Can you guys help me sell this first huge project to Seagate? And we were like, well, you're going to pay us, right? And he said, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. So over the next three years, we ended up working together over and over and over again. And then one day, he and I were having lunch, and we were like, what are you trying to do? Well, I'm trying to grow this company. What are you trying to do? I'm trying to grow this company. Well, why don't we smash the companies together, and 
will be bigger and better and, and that'll be awesome. And so that's what we did in 2014. Um, and so it's been a lovely ride ever since. Um, so let's talk about Chibo. How am I doing on time? Great, 15 or 20 minutes left. Awesome. So at Chibo, we call ourselves um, a, uh, an integrated brand experience agency. Uh, what does that mean? Um, it means that we help companies think about their brands strategically, and we design the experiences that produce those brands. And I want to unpack this a little bit because the history of brands in general is interesting. So once upon a time, there was a guy named Walter Landor, started Landor at Associates. This guy basically invented brand strategy and brand thinking. And he said, quite wisely, a brand is a promise which is to say that what your company is represents a promise of something to customers. And back in that day, it was like, all right, well, what is that promise? Let's put that lighthouse on the hill and everybody will flock to us, right? We'll do some product stuff, some marketing and advertising. We've got some retail channels and the customer will come to us and be, you know, uh, that promise will be alluring and that's what branding is. It's making our announcement of what our promise is and customers will love it and they will flock to us, right? Um, but then somebody realized, well, that's not, that's not quite right, or that's not quite as, as powerful as, as you might think. Um, what would actually be more powerful would be if you focused on what the customer actually wants, right? And so let's think about the customer, and if you listen to the customer, you think about their world and their needs, and you build your brand around that. You focus your brand on, and it's promise on what the customer wants, not what you think is great and expecting the customer to come to you. So that was great, you know, and Coca-Cola was like, amazing things happen when you, when you listen to the customer. And then sort of the internet and social media happened, and all of a sudden we now have this crazy world that we live in today where customers sort of are assaulted everywhere, they're, they're, they're overwhelmed. We've got social media, we've got you know, corporate culture being visible to the outside, we've got different competitors and collaborators, lots of different channels, different voices, people are multitasking, uh, there's product, there's content marketing, there's all this stuff and it's this soup of craziness. Um, and in this universe, like you don't control your brand as much as customers do. And what people realize is that our brand isn't some idea that we have in the world. Our brand lives in the minds of customers. And what we own is the moments that make up those experiences that, that customers have. And so that's why as Chibo, Keynote doesn't like us. Um, that's why we believe this, and this organizes everything that we do. We believe the experience is the brand, not what you say, not what you hope, not what you think, not what you've written on some slides someplace. The, your brand as a company is nothing more and nothing less than the sum total of all the experiences that customers have with you which means that your brand is not one thing, it's many things, and it's made up of all these different moments of experience. There are moments when customers are just first finding out about you, and those tend to be advertising and communication types moments. There's moments where customers are like, huh, maybe I want what they've got, where they're considering you, and they might be doing research on your website or out there on third party websites that talk about you or asking their friends on social media what they think. Then there's buying moments, purchase moments, where people go out and actually buy what you offer. Uh, there's usage, when people are actually using your product or service. There's support, because inevitably people need help. And then there's the advocacy, which is the end of that customer life cycle, which is how do you actually build relationships with customers and have them become your advocates and do your marketing for you, because in this day and age, that's the most powerful thing to grow your company. Um, turns out that this is really, really important uh, to a lot of CEOs. You go around to lots of companies, as Forrester Research does every year, and you say, how important is delivering a great brand experience to your customers? And you know, is it one of your top four or five corporate initiatives? And 90% of the CEOs say, yes, that is. But then if you turn around and you go ask that company's customers whether they get a great experience, only 3% of them actually agree that they get a great experience. This is a huge gulf. 
And for us, this is the opportunity space that Chibo works in, right? It's about helping companies deliver the kind of experiences that they, that they hope to deliver and therefore be the kind of brands that they hope. And as I mentioned before, this is a great competitive advantage in the marketplace um, because when, when Keynote wants to work, um, uh, companies that do this well outperform companies that don't by a very large margin. So what does all of this look like in terms of a project, right? I've showed you some pretty pictures up front. I talked about the kinds of things that we do, the kind of thinking that we do for clients, and so I thought I would share with you a case study of one particular startup company that we worked with uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, this company's name is Evolve, and Evolve is a physical threat assessment company, uh, which is fancy words for they're building the thing that's gonna uh, eliminate and replace that horrible thing that we all assume the position in in the airports, right? That we wait in long lines to go experience um, uh, that has resulted in all these incredible long delays in getting to your flight, right? And this thing doesn't require you to take off your shoes, doesn't require you to take off your jacket, doesn't require you to take your keys or your cell phone out of your pocket. You just walk right through it and it's got all the same advanced sensors of those millimeter wave things that rotate around you. Plus it's got facial recognition, video built in, a magnetometer like the, um, you know, uh, the metal detector that you walk through, and all sorts of whiz-bang gizmos that allow security guards that could be a whole state away to watch you go through and see that your scan of your, your, your uh, presence uh, on the um, thing. And so this company came to us, they had a logo which didn't quite look like that. We, we fixed the logo, I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, uh, a, a B round of funding, uh, they had designed this product and they said, look, we need to help launch this product in the marketplace and we need people to know who we are. We need to create a brand for ourselves. Uh, and we said, okay, what else? And they said, well, and by the way, we need to go raise another $15 million because if we don't do that, we can't pay you. And we said, okay, well, there's job number one. Job number one is telling your story. And so the, one of the first things that we did for this company was take what was one of the worst looking PowerPoint decks I've ever seen in my entire life and build a narrative for them that really talked about who are you, why do you exist, why do you matter, what are you trying to do, what's the benefit of your product, and why would somebody want to invest in you? So here's an example of sort of what their pitch deck looked like to explain you know, what they were trying to achieve as a company. It worked, they went out, they got $15 million uh, C round of funding, uh, and then they were like, great, let's, let's go build this brand. So uh, as we want to do, we do a lot of workshops with people, uh, try to understand how their business works, what kind of interactions they have with their customers, what their value proposition is. I got the, the uh, enviable task of in, uh, interviewing uh, all their board members. Their board members <laughs> were the ex-director of the CIA, the former head of Homeland Security, the former CTO for Homeland Security, uh, the former head of uh, uh, one of the FBI divisions on the East Coast, like serious, serious people. Um, uh, and I was, I was talking with an ex-director of, of the CIA and saying, hey, you know, blah, blah, blah. So what happens when somebody walks through this thing and you find a gun or a, a worse, a bomb. And he said, and he was you know, a good New Yorker, he said, well, you Alda, you run. But the guys standing there, they have two choices. Do you shoot them in the leg or do you shoot them in the head? And I said, nope. All right, next question. <laughs> um, uh, so <laughs> we do lots of workshops with these folks, lots of interviews, and the goal really is, is trying to understand the entirety of this company's customer experience, current and future. Um, and as we do that, we begin to start to understand the way that these folks can and want to interact with their customers. We start to understand their culture. We also start to understand who their customers really are, which is a really important thing, because at the end of the day, 
right? We need to produce an experience for those customers. Well, what do those customers care about? So one of their customers is the motivated executive. Now, I said that this device is gonna replace those horrible machines in the airports, but it takes a long time for that technology to get there unless there's a big event like 9-11 and we haven't had one of those for a while. So it's gonna take a while. In the meantime, there are a lot of other places, thank you, nightclub shooting in Florida, thank you, various other things, that all of a sudden care an awful lot about physical security. So their main t uh, customer at the moment are executives who basically cannot afford to have a horrible mass casualty event on their watch. Um, and so they're very interested. Uh, we had to come up with essentially what this company believed in. One of the most important and powerful things that you do when you're working on a company's brand is try and get down to the why that lies behind everything that they do. Why does this company exist? And for this company, this was their belief, that the world has changed, but the security industry hasn't. That we live in a post-ISIS world, everything is now a target, but the industry still uses basically 150-year-old technology the same archaic approaches and technology and incremental change won't do it. We need a revolution in physical security. It's time to evolve. See what I did there? Um, so uh, we also have to uh, come up with what is this company's personality? What do they sound like? Um, and so we develop a persona for the company. We write that out as a narrative. Hello, we're Evolve. We don't want to talk at you, we want to talk with you. Whenever possible, we'd rather converse than broadcast. That's because fundamentally we're team players. They're about enabling security teams. I won't read this rest, uh, the, the rest of this to you. But one of the other things that we worked on uh, and think about when we're doing brands is, well, what kind of relationship do you want to have with your customer? And therefore, what rights do they have? And so quite often we'll build something called a customer bill of rights. And so their customer bill of rights is as follows. You have the right as a customer to always be the good guy. That's what we're helping you do. You're out there saving lives. You have the right to know what we know. Transparency is hugely important. How the technology works and doesn't work is critical to being successful. You have the right to a world-class product that performs as advertised. You have the right to SWAT level service. Um, at the end of the day, these people are on the front line and if something goes wrong, they can't afford to have downtime. Um, you have the right to do it your way. They're building products that allow you to create a flexible security situation uh, that's configured to work the way that you want. And you have the right as a customer to shape our evolution as a company which is to say that we're building products for you, and that means your feedback is, is really, really important. Um, we work on the personality traits of the company. These were their seven personality traits, transformative, expert, relentless, pragmatic, optimistic, dependable, and genuine. Um, this is, we define each of these, so this is what expert means. We don't have all the answers, but you'll be hard pressed to find somebody better equipped to solve today's security problems and anticipate tomorrow's. We talk about then, and this is a really key part of doing brand experience strategy rather than brand strategy. We talk about what does that mean in terms of the customer's experience. Remember, a brand is only the customer's experience. And so if you want to bring a brand to life, if you want to have a certain personality as a company, what are the things that you have to do to produce the experience of that personality in your customers? And so what does an expert experience feels like? Well, it leaves the customer with the feeling like, Whoever designed this really knows what the heck that they're doing. An expert experience displays intelligence in every interaction. It's accurate, it's data-driven, it's powerful in its simplicity, it's confident, inspiring, and it provides real value. So we design that entire customer experience for these people. I'll zoom in here a little bit. So this is looking at all the different micro interactions or moments we call them. Uh, that a company has with its customers and thinking about what do we have to do in each of those moments to deliver on the, and be the kind of brand that we want to be. Then we also do the cool design stuff like designing their business cards, working on their logo. Uh, they still needed letterhead. A lot of companies don't even bother with this step anymore. Designing their website that explains their product, uh, coming up with their email marketing template. So what is the emails that they send out every morning talking about uh, all the horrible things that are happening in the world um, in the security space, uh, product brochures, uh, basically all the tools that company needs to get to market, and then also helping them think about what they're doing in the future. So we came up with the names of all their next products. So their first product was called Edge. They're gonna come up with a smaller, uh, you know, lightweight one that's gonna be for more for nightclubs called Post. They're gonna come up with a completely invisible one that's embedded in floors and walls called Ring. They're gonna come up with a table that can work you know, to scan bags at ballparks and things like that. 
Um, and then they've got a couple video security related things and facial recognition stuff. And so um, that's what uh, those, uh, those product names are. So that's an example of the kind of work we do and that shows you the actual work product of the company. Um, and uh, what we do. It's a lot of writing at the strategy phase and then, and then the visual design. Um, so now let me sort of lift up 100 levels and provide you some high level insight in thinking about how brands are constructed in, in the world. So not just through experience, but, but what does it really mean to think about a brand? And so brands uh, are created sort of through the intersection of three main vectors. Um, uh, number one is story, narrative. We all think that way. People have gone so far as to say our brains are structured around narrative structure. There's a reason that all stories have an exposition, a conflict, a rising action, a resolution, and a denouement, because that's the neural structure that we, that we have as a species. Um, they're also structured around value. People need to get something. And they're structured around relationships, and I realize that word is a little hard to read. But let's talk about each of those in turn. Um, story. Story is really important, and I have a great illustration of that. Imagine coming across an ad for a used car. 1996 Honda Accord for sale, two-door coupe, green automatic leather seats. Greeny is a treasure. The original paint is in fantastic shape, save for a few cosmetic dings. See photos. Drives like a dream. Leather seats, great condition. 141,095 miles. Clean title. Well-maintained maintenance records on a crest. Registered through 2018. Passed smog check in 2017. Brand new battery. Bug shield, rubber duckies, and tape converter included. It has two owners ever, me for the last 14 years, and our neighbor who sold it to us, right? Advertised price of the car, steel, $499. Kelly Blue Book value, 1400 right? This is, a, this is a great deal, right? So the guy's girlfriend wrote up this ad and was about to post it. And he said, you know, honey, we can do better than that. I know how to make films. You, you're different. You do things your way. That's what makes you one of a kind. You don't need things. You're happy with who you are. You don't care about money. You have everything you've ever wanted. You don't do it for appearances. You do it because it works. And this, this is not a car. This is you. It's a lifestyle. A choice. Your choice. Introducing a used 1996 Honda Accord, a car for people who have life figured out and just need a way to get somewhere. Luxury is a state of mind. Right? So this guy works in advertising, right? He makes this film. The end of the film says, click here to buy the car. That link goes to eBay puts it on eBay, couple days go by, week goes by, guess how high the eBay bidding went? $150,000 to the point that eBay shut down the auction because they thought it was for sure a fraud. Wouldn't let him put it back up. And then CarMax heard about it and said, hey, sorry about the eBay auction, we'll give you $20,000 for that car and they sold the car for $20,000 to CarMax. And this guy can now get a job at any ad agency he wants, right? <laughs> Same car, the only difference was story. There was a very famous research project uh, that was done, I can't remember which, which university did, they went out and they bought things for under $5 on eBay, gave them to professional writers, the writers wrote stories about those products, they put the same things back up on eBay Average increase of price in the sale price of that item, 1,155%. We care about story. We care about narrative. It has meaning to us, and it has value to us. Next thing that's important when you're building a brand is value. And value is not 
what you think it is. It is not sale, 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 lowest discounted price ever, two for the price of one. That is not value. Value is something very much deeper, economic, behavioral, sociological. Value is three subjective judgments that people make all the time. Judgment number one, it's a judgment of something's importance. How important is this? And when we say important, we mean something that has consequences for us. Something that if we get right is good, and if we don't get right is bad. Value is also a judgment about utility. How useful is something? Can I use it? How usable is it for stuff that I want to accomplish? And thirdly, worth. But it's not worth in the traditional sense. It's the return on the time, effort, money, lost opportunities I have to acquire that thing. That's how people think about value. And if you think about value that way, and know that your company has to produce that for customers, your brand has to produce that, you do things a different way. You look at the world in a different way. <clears throat> and all of this, right, value is in the, only in the context of what the customer cares about, because value judgments are subjective. And lastly, or I'm sorry, and, and what it really comes down to is value equals help. Are you providing people help with the things that they care about in their lives? And help comes in lots of different forms, right? Like Katy Perry tickets, like those aren't particularly helpful to anyone, but they deliver something of value to the people who are Katy Perry fans. Um, lots of different kinds of help. And so the question is, what kind of help are you offering your customers and is it really helpful? And then lastly, brand is about relationship. And really, like, real relationship. Um, they don't have to be complicated, but they do have to be real. And a relationship is two things. A relationship is how do you act with regards to the things that I care about, and how do I take care of the things that you care about? That's the basis of a, of a relationship. And so, Customers are looking for relationships because we relate to companies the only way we know how to relate, the same way we relate to people. And especially in this day and age on social media, we all have the expectation that we can go out there onto Twitter and say, God, that lunch sucked. You know, insert name of restaurant here. Uh, and they write back to us and say, oh, God, we're really sorry. What, what happened? You know, tell us more about that, right? Anybody who's ever complained to United Airlines know that they're right on it, right? But we, in this day and age, we have the expectation of having a relationship with companies. And even if we're not out on social media, we're relating to companies in that way. Um, and the relationship exists only if both parties are, are aware of that fact, which is to say that your customers, to the extent that you're designing brands, have to understand that you are helping them take care of things that they care about. And you have to find ways of understanding what customers think about and how they relate to you as an organization. And in addition to all that, if you can sprinkle in a little surprise and delight, that's all for the better. Um, so that's just a little bit of thinking about brand at a very high level. It's a very deep story. I could talk for hours and hours about that. Um, but. That's what I thought I would share with you tonight. And of course, my very last slide is broken uh, again. And all I really wanted to say was. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. So we get done with this horrible keynote stuff. Oh, well, I guess I'll leave that up there. Actually, I mean, it, it really is the prettiest presentation I've ever seen. So, so thank you for that. But I think we have we have about ten minutes where we can take some questions, and I don't know how your time is, but maybe you I can got, also. I got well. Stay. I got all night. I'm going to miss my daughter's bedtime, so you can have me as late as you need me. Uh, well, uh, I just have I, to be in San Jose. I think we'll do about ten minutes of questions, depending yeah. on the questions, and we'll go ahead and start. You were first. I'll start right in the middle here. And do we do we need to wait for them to get a mic? Yes. I am, uh, okay. yes, and if, if you don't mind. You know, oh, look, he just know. robbed you of your question. You'll go second. No worries, go ahead. Okay. We'll get to him second. Yeah, you, with the mic. Uh, yeah. Hi, my name is Jayesh. I'm a third year computer science major. Um, 
Awesome talk. I just wanted to know um, what your relationship with your clients is. We talked about relationships and uh, delivering value and stuff, but if I'm uh, an executive at a company and I come to you for this service, yeah. um, I'm worried yeah, I'm worried that um, your idea of my brand might be different from what I have in mind, mm -hmm. and if you might end up changing what um, what I came with, and uh, at the end of the day, I'm worried if um, you might mess with my idea of my own brand, and if, if it ends up being something that I did not think of and envision. Great. Did everybody hear the question? Yeah, okay. Um, so a couple, you had a couple questions in there. Let me address the second one first, which is that, People don't come to us because they want their brands to remain exactly the way that they are. People come to us because their brands aren't doing the work that they want their brands to do. They're not competing as well in the marketplace as they would like. They're not being recognized among their competitors. They're not able to charge as much for their services as they want. They're not getting as many customers as they want. And so they come to us and they say, please change our brand. <laughs> like if they knew how to do it themselves, they'd just go do it and they wouldn't need our help. So they come to us very much hoping for advice, hoping for change, hoping to be told, oh my God, that's the worst presentation I've ever seen. People are gonna give you money based on that? No, 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 no. There's a better way to tell the story. And so that's partially the answer to your first question, which is that what customers want is they want great advice. They want a trusted advisor. And there's this very interesting dicey part of any of the beginning of the engagement, the sales process and as we first get started with the customer, where they're like, oh my God, we're paying these people $250,000. Like, what if they're idiots? You know, and so they're like taking a little bit of a flyer on us and we have to prove in every moment that we're as valuable as they think we are, right? That we have to earn that money every second um, and we have to show our expertise. We have to not be sort of lapdogs that roll over and do whatever they say. We have to bring the whole wealth of our experience to the table and say, huh, what are you trying to achieve? We listen, we're really good listeners. We say, oh, if you're trying to achieve that, then we think we ought to go in this direction. And they're like, wow, great. And that's what they want from, from our relationship is trusted uh, advice. If you pass it two rows up to the gentleman in the gray sweatshirt. Um, thanks for your uh, speech. So, um, I've, I've like you're sucking on, like you're sucking on a lollipop. Yeah. Okay. Oh, <laughs> um, I actually have a question about your company. Um, so, do you feel like you have done like everything possible for your clients, and where do you see your company going in like five years or ten years or fifteen years? Have we done everything possible for our clients? Well. Um, that's a tricky question to answer. I think uh, I'd be lying if I said that every project result that we got was perfect. Nobody's perfect. 99.999% um, uh, of the time, customers are satisfied. They tell us, wow, that's great work, thank you. We'll buy from you again, and many times they do. Um, so I'm very happy with that and, pr and proud of that. Um, that's, that's one of the things I'm most proud of in our work. There are definitely things that we don't do for customers, like services that we don't offer, that as we get bigger, it would be great to add those services. So right now, our technology development capabilities are somewhat limited. So we end up having to partner, which is not a big deal. Um, that means two things, however. One, we're stuck managing those technology resources because we can't put that on the client. It's part of our service. And we're not as great at that as we would like. And two, we don't make as much money on that as we would if those people were full-time employees. And so that affects our margin on certain projects. So as we grow, we're looking to add those kinds of capabilities and build out more people that can do more different kinds of things in the company. Um, we also don't get enough like really hardcore multi-month research projects to f employ a full-time researcher, for instance. Uh, we have a network of freelancers, as we do for a number of different roles that we bring in and work regularly with, but as we grow, uh, we'd love to have those people come in full-time. Um, and so in five to 10 years, I'd like to see us twice our size. Uh, we've got about um, uh, 25, 30 full-time people right now and about 15 or 20 contractors that we work with. I'd like to see us twice that size in San Francisco and maybe one or more offices elsewhere through the United States and the world. We have a lot of, as I said, work in Southeast Asia, so a Singapore office might be around the corner for us. Next question, what do you got? Back there, hi. Uh, hello, I'm Henry. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, so my question is, so you can make this awesome brand 
experience on uh, on like a, on like paper. But how do you make sure that your um, clients, employees, translate that branding experience to their customers? Great question. So. I left something off that slide. <laughs> Story, value, relationship. And it's really not so much that I left it off, because those are the things, th that's the constellation of stuff that customers sort of experience from you and make judgments about. But all three of those things come from one place, and that is your company culture. And so a lot of times, and I didn't show you the slides, but there are probably about 12 slides about the corporate culture of that company Evolve that was really, really important for us to define and to highlight. One of the things I like to say is that as a company, you can only deliver the kind of customer or brand experience that your culture is capable of. And so when we do work with brands, we do an awful lot of work to understand and in many cases shape the company's culture. Um, and that goes as deep as literally like organizational structures and reporting relationships and monetary incentives. You know, uh, a classic one in the business world is that you have a call center. That call center is responsible for interacting with the customers. Those call center people, not so much these days, but still in some places, are incented for how quickly they get off the phone how quickly they can get a call, quote unquote, resolved, which for them is click, done, on to the next one. They're not compensated for how well they solved the customer's problem or how good the customer thought that was experience was. Now, of course, we've all experienced the, when you're done with this call, please remain on the line and take our survey, right? They're trying to figure out how, how you thought that experience was. But uh, that's a classic cultural problem. And so we walk into a company, we look at how they operate, and we say, hey, you, you want to deliver a great experience, you've got to stop that. Right? You've got to sit there as much time as you need to on the phone with that person who's calling in to get a, a loan out of their 401k account to pay for their kid's you know, surgery. And you have no empathy. You're talking to them about you know, all the penalties that they're going to get to go help their sick kid. Like, no, stop that. Take the time and say, God, I'm really sorry to hear about your kid. You know, you know, are you sure this is enough money? We'll make sure you get this quickly. Is there anything else I can do to help you? All that stuff. So culture is huge, and thank you for the question, because that's a, a big piece of working on any company's brand. What else? Uh, who else has got a mic? How about right here? Ma'am. It's been all guys. Let's get, let's get a gal in here. And I think we can take two more questions. Okay. So think of a good one over there. I got, I got time, but. You, you. So what kind of advice would you have or how would you approach corporate cultures that are like not doing so well? Like Uber, I know they have some problems with like sexual harassment and like just a bad atmosphere. So uh, that's a huge entrenched problem. Uh, that is, above, you know, in some ways above my pay grade, above our pay grade as a, as a company. Um, cultures like that generally come from leadership. Um, and until you get rid of those bad actors, those things don't change, and quite often until you get rid of the people who have been heavily influenced and sort of coupled to that thinking and behavior until they're gone, those things, those things don't change. Um, it's really hard. It's one of the hardest things in the corporate world, and even if it isn't a you know, awful thing like you know, sexual harassment or something like that, even if it's just like a poor orientation. One of our clients right now is a big semiconductor company and they bought another big semiconductor company and that semiconductor company that they, brought, that they bought were frankly jerks. They were assholes. They didn't care for their customers. They only cared if you had like $5 billion to spend and everyone else could go pound sand and yet they're now a major division of this company and there are huge problems, not just for the customers who are like, you guys are jerks, but for all the other employees of the company who are like, why are those people allowed to treat our customers like jerks? That's awful. But yet somehow nobody's fixing that. So it's a big, it's a big problem. So I'm about to meet with the CEO of that company on Thursday and say, hey, you have a problem. There is a toxic culture in this department. And until you fix it, you're screwed. And we'll see what, what he wants to do about that. So, yeah. Here, I got it. Oh, thank you, Alder. I guess. 
Hi. Yes. Another Hi. guy. Hi. My name's Hannah. I'm a third year legal studies major. And I was just wondering, this question might be a bit meta, but as a brand strategy and in a sense marketing um, company, how do you in a sense market yourself to kind of have companies be more inclined to pick your organization as opposed to others? And then in addition, how do you, what's the process um, in deciding who to work with? Uh, so you guys have heard of the cobbler's children syndrome. So we're really good at like doing this for other people, but we don't really spend the time and effort to do it for ourselves as well as we do it for clients because we don't pay ourselves to do that. Um, having said that, uh, as a company, we've been working on our, on our marketing um, and it's pretty standard internet age stuff, right? So we've designed our website and put a lot of content on our website that has keywords that we're always adding content to that match the kind of things that we think people might be searching for on Google when they need services like ours. Uh, I go out and give talks and um, write articles in various places so that people are like, oh, who's this guy? He's a CXO, Chibo, I've never heard of that company. Um, uh, so that people hear, hear about our company. We advertise on NPR. If any of you guys listen to NPR early in the morning, you might have heard our ads uh, you know, talking about Chibo, um, uh, San Francisco uh, brand strategy and design agency, blah, 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 blah. Um, we do paid search advertising where we buy certain keywords on the internet and write little text ads. And when you click on those ads, you end up on specialized landing pages that are designed to get you to fill out a form so that you send your information in and then we can contact you. Um, we have a system called HubSpot that pays attention to who comes onto our website. And if we see that Ford Motor Company has come there 10 times in the last week, we go onto LinkedIn and see, all right, who do we know at Ford? And who can we call up and say, hey, why are you guys coming to our website? Um, we sponsor talks in San Francisco where we bring people into our offices and give talks. We ask customers to refer us to other people. Um, we ask them, uh, do you know anybody who could use our services? So it's a whole, a whole range of stuff that we do um, to market our services as a, as a company. Um, and then the question of how do we decide who to work with? Um, well, we're not a huge company. Uh, and so there's only a certain level of choosiness that you can be about um, when you got to pay for the, you know, 27 people that are, you know, depending on you to feed their children. Um, but having said that, we try and work with ambitious companies who understand and align with the philosophy that we have. There's nothing worse than believing that this is how you do good design and this is how you work with companies and trying to work with a company that doesn't believe or understand that and wants you to just, just design our website. Why are you talking about all these other things like how somebody gets to the website and what they do after it? No, just, just, just design the website. Um, we tend to shy away from situations like that because we don't think we can do our best work there and we don't think we can ultimately satisfy that client. We also don't like to work with jerks. And I mean that literally, like we'll have a meeting with people and we're like, oh, these people feel like they're gonna be awful to work with. We just suddenly got really busy. And so we're not gonna we're not not gonna work with you. So I think that's my attempt to answer your question. And there was one last one here. Yeah, and then you guys can come down. No problem. Hi, Alder. My name is Marcel. I'm a second year poli sci major. So first of all, thank you so much for coming and talk to us. Um, so from what I understand, uh, you know, UI UX is a field that's not exactly a hard science. So you talked a lot about bringing value to your customers, your clients. So I'm curious to know what kind of metrics do you measure uh, in order to validate um, the return on investment for your clients? Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of different things to measure and there are some things that are unmeasurable. So when we're designing transactional experiences, that's the easiest one. We're redesigning the interaction that somebody has on a website um, that, where they have to go buy something. Right, so there's a certain conversion rate. How many people sort of start the process and finish the process, there's a ratio of that. And if we've done a good job, that goes up. So when we redesigned Room and Board's website, conversion went up 18% overnight. 
Average time spent on the site went up, the number of products that people looked at in any given shopping session went up, and the average order size also went up. So we made them millions of dollars. So those are the easy things. Um, you can also do that in the advertising world, which is like how many people saw the ad, how many people clicked through the ad, how many people entered the, the top of the funnel, things like that. There are less, there are more fuzzy things to measure that you can go out and you can do statistically, like how many people have heard of your company? What kind of impression do they have of that company? Is that good, bad, or otherwise? Um, and then there's just the ineffable sort of like, do we feel like we're better telling our story out there in the world? And long term, is business improving? And it's, you can't, it's hard to tie that directly back to, to brand work that gets done. But if you work hard enough, you can, you can make those, those kinds of connections. Um, do our, do our uh, uh, employees feel better about the company? Do they believe that the story that we're telling is more representative of what we have to offer and our value? Um, there are things like net promoter score, which is a common measure out there in the world, which is you know, how many people will say that they would recommend to you. Um, it's actually not nearly as cool as how many people have actually recommended you, which you have to measure in, in different and more specialized ways. Um, there's things like customer effort, where you're asking the customers, how easy was this for you on a certain scale? And ideally, you want all those numbers to be going down. Um, lots of different things like that. Um, but what's interesting is that for some of our work, we just have a chief marketing officer that's sitting there and saying, this is the company that has my name and my career on it. It looks like ass. I want it to be better. Could you just make us look better? And when we do that, they're like, oh, thank you. Now I can actually put it on LinkedIn and I'm, you know, I don't have to worry about it. So there's also a very personal aspect of it, which is that people want to live in a nice looking house. And if you spruce up that house for them, they're really happy and they're willing to pay for that. <laughs>